Field Notes, the monthly podcast of Modern Steel Construction, the monthly magazine of AISC. I'm your host, Jeff Weisenberger, editor and publisher of Modern Steel Construction. This month's guest is Tricia Ruby, president and CEO of Ruby and Associates in the Detroit area. The firm was founded by her father, Dave Ruby, who is now one of her employees, and we'll get to that in a bit. Tricia, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to speak with me today. Um, I guess I kind of wouldn't mind starting th- from the beginning. Uh, you, know, you know, you're the president and CEO of Ruby and Associates now, but let's go way back. What, what did you want to be when you were growing up? Uh, you know, that's a good question. I know I never wanted to be asked that question when I was growing <laughs> up. Um, I dreamt of being uh, an Olympic sprinter. I dreamt of being a soccer player. Um not really a career path that was available to me. Um, and I loved math, but I didn't think a lot about the, what do you want to be? I have to say, uh, I remember getting into high school, um, and, and becoming a senior. And then that's when the question started mm-hmm. and I was like, Oh, am I supposed to know that? Like I, <laughs> I'm a really, I was a good student, you know, I love math and good at science and, um, but it was so interesting that those questions just started coming. Like I was instantly supposed to know that now that I'm a senior in high school. So I thought that was really overwhelming. So I actually never asked a senior in high school what they want to be because I remember not liking that question. But I do remember feeling like I'm not going to be an engineer. I'm not going to be what my dad does. <laughs> I'm going to be the opposite, whatever that is. Um, you know, I always felt like he, he was so ingrained and so engaged, which is amazing. Um, and I was like, oh, it's just all encompassing and all, uh, you know, it just, it, it enveloped his entire being. Mm-hmm. And I didn't feel that about, way about anything. And so I was like, I'm definitely not going to be that. Um, so obviously that didn't work out so well for me, but, um, (laughs) (laughs) uh, I went, uh, I went off to Purdue university and I actually went to Purdue to not be an engineer. So I think I got accepted to the liberal arts college or something. I have no idea, honestly, what I was, um, thinking I was going to be. Um, and of course I'm going to the university that graduates the most engineers in the country, Mm -hmm. um, which I didn't really maybe realize that either. And so when I asked my dad, like, why did you send me off to, and he didn't send me off, like it's where I wanted to go, Mm -hmm. but where, why did you send me off to this college, this university that graduates more engineers and I wasn't going to be an engineer. And he said, well, yeah, I knew you'd come around because, (laughs) you know, my dad was my, my go-to for homework and. Um, so he, he knew how I thought. And so he obviously saw that in me, but he never pushed me to thou shalt be an engineer. I think he knew that that probably wouldn't have been the right strategy. Mm -hmm. So, um, but he knew I loved math and he said, you always asked why every time I helped you with anything, you didn't want to just know the answer. You wanted to know, but why, but why is it like that? And he's like, that's how engineers think. And so he just like, I knew you'd be an engineer. So after my freshman year, um, actually I went to school. I didn't have a calculus class my first semester and math was my favorite subject for my entire life. Like I would make up long division problems as a kid. I was not a reader, so I wasn't reading books in my spare time. I was making up long division problems. So um, if that will tell you anything about me. Uh, and so I didn't have a math class my first semester and it almost broke me. Like I went to my counselor about three weeks in and I said, I, I don't know what to do without a math class. Like my brain needs math. And so he's like, well, you have too many credits. So I can't get you at a math class until next semester. So that's what started me onto this, um, to transferring into engineering because it's how my brain works. Um, but I, I studied industrial engineering and not, not civil structural, okay. and like a much bigger picture thinker. And so, um, I actually was interested in human factors engineering. I'm a left-handed hmm. and so the world is not designed for left-handed people. And no. so the whole idea of human factors and how design affects different people was really what got me interested in industrial engineering. And, uh, so a very different path to being where I am today, obviously, but um, it was the right path for me. Sure. Yeah. And your dad was obviously very observant. I mean, he probably noticed when you were, uh, instead of reading, make, you were you were instead making up long division problems when you were younger. And that's the most interesting. I think that's the, you might be the first person I've ever heard say, I went to Purdue to not be an engineer. 
I know. Those words have never been spoken. That's a great <laughs> quote. <laughs> I love that. The, the statistic that my dad and I like to quote is like only like the statistics are that only like one in one million people transfer into engineering. There's thousands and thousands and thousands of students that transfer out of engineering after, you know, the first uh, C on an exam or something like that. But um, I actually transferred into engineering. No, that's so, amazing. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. It, it reminds me of when I was in school. I had I lived in a dorm with a lot of people who were going to go into the life sciences, and the weed out class for that was organic chemistry. Mm -hmm. And uh, after that first semester of organic chemistry, a lot of people went into something else. Yes, right. Like, yes, yeah. I've heard all kinds of bad things about organic chemistry, <laughs> and I never had to take it thankfully. Right, but you seem like the kind of person who'd say, "Gosh." I'm going to try, like in your sophomore year, I'm going to try <laughs> organic chemistry. I'm going to try that, but I did not. <laughs> well, that's, no. that's great. That's, a, that's, a, that's great to hear. Um, industrial engineering, I, mean, I, I guess like the point is there, every, every type of engineering you need some sort of math. And so you kind of got your fix and then yeah. uh, it kind of pushed you yeah, on from there. Yeah, it's all the same math. The first two years are all the same pretty much in every engineering field, at least mm -hmm. at Purdue. Um, I, I know universities teach differently now, a lot more project-based learning out there, but um, yeah, the first two years in any, any major at, at Purdue is the same. So same basic in chemistry, physics, uh, calculus, et cetera. So I got all that, which was great. Um, and industrial engineering is, is I focus really on manufacturing. I love manufacturing. Mm -hmm. I was a manufacturing engineer after graduation. Okay. And when I look at construction, you know, it's manufacturing. When I talk to a fabricator, they're manufacturers, you know, right. so. I, I feel totally at home in a fab shop visiting clients because like I love the smell of a of a plant. I love the smell of a wood plant. I worked for a furniture manufacturer after graduation and they had, you know, wood furniture and I love the smell of metal in a plant. It's just something about it. I don't I can't describe it, sure. but I love visiting um fabricators because it's just I feel at home there. Very, yeah, very good. And I'm 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 wondering too if when, every time you walk into a fabrication shop, you, you have that thought in your head. Now, if I were laying this shop out, oh, I would. <laughs> totally. I mean, it's how my brain works. It's how I, I, you know, it's how I think when I open up, walk up to a buffet. I mean, it's just like, <laughs> like how is this thing out? Is it the most efficient thing? Could right. they, have, you know, put things in different places? You know, what's the flow of people? I mean, it's. Mm -hmm. it's it, yeah, I, look, I think about that at airports. I think about that kind of everywhere I go. So, but yeah, if I'm in a fab shop, I'm, I'm looking at the flow of material. I'm looking at the inventory. I'm looking at the process. Um, it's just, yeah, I can't get that out of my brain. Gotcha. Yeah, no, very good. I could see that. Like everything, everything, everywhere you go sort of becomes a, a challenge or a problem to solve. <laughs> right. Um, so, you know, it, it sounds like engineering wasn't what you were thinking of really early on in, in life, but, um, you know, after graduation, did you see yourself working for your dad right away? Or tell me a little bit about uh, post-graduation. Graduation. It sounds like you worked for a furniture manufacturer, for example. Yeah, I mean, I didn't ever, I didn't ever think I would work at Ruby and Associates for my dad, okay. um, being a different engineer. Um, yeah, I, I pursued a career in manufacturing and then in supply chain um, and found that to be, you know, kind of where my brain worked and it was it was definitely a valuable time in those companies um and then you know ruby and associates had this wonderful thing called an embezzlement back in the hmm. early 2000s late 90s um, i guess it was 2001 and um so i found i was I actually had a had a baby i was staying at home with my first child mm -hmm. um and i offered to come home to help my dad for a couple of weeks. I got a call basically saying the business is in trouble, you know, can you come home for a couple of weeks and just help, sure. help me out. And, um, you know, that was 24 years ago. So 23 years ago. Um, so that was a big change. I was living in Atlanta at the time okay. and, um, decided to come back and help. It was pretty much over the Christmas holidays. So, um, a time that was very convenient to come back. We were planning on being back here anyway. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, I, I um, started helping and probably a month in, I realized that this was going to be the next phase of my life. Um, really um, have enjoyed all of it, but definitely a different path to get to um, being at Ruby and Associates. Um, 
but I felt like all of my experience in my previous jobs um, as an industrial engineer really helped prepare me for what I'm doing now, you know, having a big picture thought. Um, I was always a very keenly aware employee. Mm -hmm. So whenever a company that I was working for, and I always worked for very large companies, mm -hmm. um, whenever they would make a decision, I was just very mindful of how I felt about it as an employee and, and always said to myself, if I'm ever in charge of something, I'm going to make a different decision. Um, and so I don't know if all people think this way, but like, I'm, I'm a person that thinks about life as a series of decisions, um, you know, that other people make. And I always wanted to be a decision maker. So in any situation that I'm in, mm -hmm. I don't feel like I'm in a decision that happened or I'm in a situation that happened to be that way. It's you're in whatever situation because decisions were made by people mm -hmm. for this to look this way. You know, it's somebody decided this, the chair you're sitting on, somebody made that decision. Mm -hmm. Somebody decided the paint color of the hotel room you're in, you know? Um, sure. And so I, I've always, viewed the world that way and felt like if I could be in the room making decisions, that's where ultimately I want to be. Sure. Well, so, very, yeah. yeah, very good. I was going to say, um, right. And it's, it's, it's a series of decisions and the better ones tend to be more mindful, well-researched decisions. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. And, and when it comes to, um, companies, you know, all decisions affect employees. So I was just always mindful of that. And, and I've been able to bring that here. So I'm a very employee, employee centric decision making process. Um, if it's better for them, then it's in my mind, it's better for the company. So, uh, so that's been an interesting perspective, I think, to bring to leadership. It's not, I don't, find that all leaders make decisions that way. So right, leaders definitely not. What's ever better for them. <laughs> sure. Uh, so I, I don't find that to be the right way to make decisions. No, well, that's a good thing. I mean, you know your audience, right? Your 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 customers, are your audience, but as, as the CEO, the president and CEO, you're to a certain degree, your your employees are also your audience, and you you know that's that's I think your approach is a good one. For sure. For sure. So I have to ask, and I want to talk a little bit about that that particular role that you're in now. But I, before that one, can you tell me what is what's been the most pleasant surprise about working, you know, specifically for a company that your dad started? You know, I think there's a couple of things. I mean, first, just getting to experience my dad from a different perspective. I mean, you know, before I started working here, he was my dad, so mm -hmm. he was. You know, like you think of anybody, he's, he's, he was my soccer coach. Um, he was the guy that helped me with my homework. Um, always my biggest cheerleader, um, you know, at all my athletic events. And um, and then he helped me get through, you know, even though he was far away from Purdue, uh, whenever I did poorly on an exam, I'd call him and he's like, it's fine, you know. <laughs> you're going to be just fine. It's, it's engineering school is tough, but you're going to be fine. So he was just always very encouraging. Um, but it really wasn't until I started working with him that I realized what an incredible background and resume he has. So mm -hmm. that's been interesting. You know, like I knew our moving history as child, as, as a child was aligned with his career, obviously, you know, being in Chicago to start out where he worked on, John Hancock and mm -hmm. Sears Tower and San Oil Oil Tower. Um, you know, I knew that as a kid, but I didn't really get it how iconic that was until I started working with him. Sure. Um, so that's been really neat um, and getting to meet so many of the people that he grew up in the industry with um, and just the goodwill that he has in the industry. That's so that's been really great. And the other really pleasant surprise is now that I've taken over. Um, you know, I, I just appreciate how much he's trusted me with the company. Mm -hmm. Um, he, you'll hear a lot of nightmares of founders that won't go away or founders <laughs> that are, that are in the way right. or, you know, their, their roadblocks or they, you know, undermine the next generation. And my dad's just, just not been that guy. He's, he has been my, you know, one of my best employees. <laughs> <And> <laughs> That's good to hear. I, I joke when I say that, but, um. 
just so trusting and recognizing that I bring a different perspective. Obviously, I'm not the structural engineer, but that I um, I have a much better business mind than he had, and he really appreciates that and values it and and sees the benefits of it. Um, in in the in the Ruby we are today, uh, we have we do a great place to work survey every year, and um, <laughs> this the comments are anonymous, but my father's are always very obvious, and his this year was I wish I were thirty years younger. Um, because he really wishes that he could kind of relive um, and continue living uh, under my leadership, which is which is pretty great. Yeah. So that's an excellent perspective. Um, yeah. And it's yeah, very it's that, that you know that again. I mean, I think good leadership obviously runs in the family because for him to be able to kind of not step aside so to so to speak, but like look to, look at the business from a different perspective and trust you to take it over is is amazing. Um, I will say I have a daughter who's 17 now and a son who's 12. And I remember, and my son is very smart too, but I remember even before he was born when my daughter was, I don't know what age she was, but I remember thinking, yeah, like maybe when she was a toddler, I'm like, she's she's going to be smarter than me. And, 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 pretty, <laughs> right. and, and then as, as she got older, I'm like, yep, I was right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I have three boys and two of one just graduated with a robotics engineering degree and one's in biomedical engineering. Oh, that's excellent. So my third one is a math whiz, but he's going the game design route. But yes, I think, you know, when you have an engineer in your hands, they're pretty, they're, they're pretty easy to pick out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Early on, right? <laughs> Early on, right. I always joke that I had, I had three kids so that I could do more math homework being the math lover that I am. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, all three of my kids never needed help with math math homework. So it was, I failed. Definitely uh, failed. Oh, so. no. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, I, I help my son with his math. And then sometimes his bigger sister, um, you know, if I can't get it, she can. And, yeah. you know, sometimes it's because uh, I think part of it, she, she, she was just really was good at math. But also it's like it's a little more recent. And I'm trying to think with this, you know, fifth and sixth grade math. Right. I remember this, but I don't remember this. Mm -hmm. Luckily, I can get online now and see how to solve the problem right. and explain it. Yes. But since she had just taken the class a few years before, it's fresh in her head. So, um, yeah, she can help them a little more can, uh, efficiently. Uh, you yeah. know, that bickering aside, that's the other part. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> um, so, so how long have you been the president and CEO there? And, and you know, from there, I've just got to be curious, what was that very first day like in that role? Um, okay, so I've been leading as president CEO since 2010, um, but I think I didn't actually, we didn't give my, I was a COO at that time, and I, we didn't, I didn't want the title <laughs> right away. I, so I, I think that leads to your second question, because mm -hmm. I was like, I'm not sure what this first day is going to be like, so I'm going to just... I'm just going to not be this. We're just not going to have a CEO. I'm just not going to be the CEO. I'm going to do the job. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, a year later, our board is like, all right, Trisha, nobody else would accept this. You have to take the title. So <laughs> um, kind of silly that we did that. But um, I just remember feeling like, and this is not a reflection of our firm, but more probably more a reflection of the pressure I put on myself. Um, I was really... I think I, I, that year, I wanted that year without the title because I was really unsure of the acceptance that I would get mm -hmm. as a non-structural engineer. Um, and again, I had relationships with all of our, you know, my executive team now, my leadership team now. I've known them for most of my life. Um, so I knew I had their support. But I think I still, for me, was really self-conscious about um, not having that um, pedigree. Sure. And I remember going to an ACEC meeting, American Council of Engineering Companies, mm -hmm. and talking about, and like the first thing I would say was like, well, we're a structural engineer, an engineering firm, but I'm not a structural engineer. And, and the first guy I talked to said, you know, none of us practice anymore. You know, if you're, if you're a, a leader at, you know, a larger engineering firm, you're mm -hmm. most likely not doing that. Mm -hmm. much anymore you know there's too much to do on the leadership side right so that made me feel a lot better um but i would say um i remember feeling like i have a big target on my back and sure. i think i put that target on my back i wouldn't say that anybody here did because i had nothing but total support um 
just like my dad recognizing my um, ability to manage a business, all my, my coworkers felt the same way. So it was more the pressure that I put on myself, but I remember mm -hmm. it feeling very different. Um, and so I talk a lot about um, the courage necessary to leave because, you know, there's a lot of, um, a lot of articles out there on like, what's the best quality to have for a leader. Mm -hmm. And I don't feel like courage is mentioned enough. And I really feel like that is, that was the hardest, not the hardest thing, but, um, that was, I think the quality that was most important is you, you're putting yourself out there every single day. You're making decisions every single mm -hmm. day. Mm -hmm. And are they the right ones? I don't know. They're the right ones for what you think of in that moment. Um, and I think having the courage to put yourself out there and, and have conviction is important. The courage to, you know, have feedback and also the courage to change course if something isn't working. Mm -hmm. But, um, I think that that's one of the most important, um, things And I, I had an HR consultant friend and, and she said those words to me that leadership takes courage. And mm -hmm. when she said those words, it like really changed my entire perspective on what it would take to leave this firm. Um, it's such a simple concept, but I think it's something that I really um, took to heart and I truly believe in. Well, that's great to hear. That's yeah. No, I think that's, that sounds like a, that sounds like an excellent approach. Um, and so I, I, along with that, I was going to say, you know, you've, you've emphasized that you, you aren't, you know, a structural engineer. And I think it's kind of like, the, it's sort of like everybody knows that. And then, and you realize that too, obviously. And then, but you, well, you know, you did have some engineer, you did have like the engineering type of mind. Sure. Oh yeah. But, right. yes, I, yeah. It <laughs> took lots of, yeah. All of, all of the things, you get thermodynamics and circuits and statics and all that lovely thing, all those, all those things. Right. And, and who knows, and maybe it would have been a different story if you didn't have that background, but you know, either way, like you said, I think the courage is that, and you know, just having the convictions and knowing when to go in a different route that those are, that's you're you're absolutely right. That's what makes a good leader or one, one of the qualities. Um, sure. That being said, you said, it sounds like you have done, uh, I, and I've seen this, I think on uh, stated as well, you've done everything at Ruby except design buildings. Mm -hmm. um, but of course you, you, I'm sure you've seen plenty of great projects from your staff over the years. And I was just curious, you know, since since you've been working there, is are, are there any in particular that stand out that were, you know, more memorable the, than the rest, or you know, one or two projects that you you are absolutely the most proud of? And 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 is since this is modern steel construction, can you please <laughs> pick a steel one? Well, I mean, you know, we are steel experts, so of that's course. why we're hired anyway. So I don't think I could even quote a non-steel project. There you go. I don't even think there's the one that exists in our repertoire. Are there so, buildings that aren't made with steel? <laughs> I don't know. I don't. Uh, maybe. You know, my, my dad's been quoted that says that you know concrete makes great sidewalks so um he's right you know, about I that think i think it's an aisc ad from years ago um <laughs> so like a oh, great dad we're never going to be able to get in the concrete <laughs> business with that quote so so we are comfortably in a steel side um that's what we love but um for sure i would say no doubt the miami dolphins roof erection canopy okay. that we did was it's just iconic it's beautiful uh, uh i guess it's a new iconic uh, structure mm -hmm. um the amount of planning that went into that the engineering of our team here was just unreal and i've also been able to go and you know watch a real madrid and uh, barcelona mm -hmm. game in that structure which was amazing oh yeah um so and it's, I mean, the Super Bowl has been held there, the, the college national championships have been held there. So it's just a really neat project, um, very visually beautiful, and I'm really proud that we helped to put that up. Um, and, you know, the procedure for it has won lots of awards. And uh, so that was, that was, I would say that would be the one I would I'd point to the most. Um, We've done a lot of other really great things, worked on a lot of stadiums actually, mm -hmm. but, um, but that one certainly takes the cake. And, and there was another organization, I understand you're on the board of directors of the ACE Mentor Program of Southeast Michigan. I was just curious if you could talk a little bit about your philosophy on mentoring. 
Sure. Um, I'm a new board member for ACE Mentor. Okay. Um, I think it's such an important organization in the country um, with the goal of um, mentoring high school students and providing an opportunity for them to get exposure to uh, our industry. And it's, you know, typically you're mentoring students who are underrepresented in, in our industry. So, you know, women, people of color. And um, so it's really important because um, there's such a labor shortage in our industry mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we need all of the help we can get to expose um, all of these kids to this great industry. Such a great industry with um, so many opportunities in all aspects of it. So um, from that perspective, I, I, I love that organization. Um, as far as my philosophy on mentoring, um, I think it's, it's really important and certainly again this organization specifically that's providing connections to um, students who wouldn't typically have connections mm -hmm. and um, you know I'm in this industry my you'll hear a lot of the families that are in this industry or you know my dad started the company and now I'm in it my brother's in this industry um, and so there's a lot of that but then there's this whole other population of people underrepresented, they don't have those connections. Right. Um, they don't have the um, background to know what the opportunities are. You know, they didn't hear about these at the kitchen table um, like I did my entire life. Mm -hmm. So um, these are the opportunities, these, these type of mentoring programs um, help bridge that gap and let these students see themselves in different spaces, which I think is just so critical. Um, and then on mentoring, you know, that's on this, this specific program and on mm -hmm. mentoring in general, I think it's um, really important. Um, there are so many people with great knowledge. My dad's been a mentor to so many people and um, the people that still work here and people that have worked here previously. Um, there's so many so much knowledge out there and people with with things to give i think you gotta you gotta give i you know like um i i, I just those the relationships of sharing knowledge and helping bring somebody up is um is important nobody's gotten anywhere by themselves you know we've right. all gotten to where we are by the people we've surrounded ourselves with and the connections that people have made for us and those that we've made on our own and um I just think it's it's essential. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's a balance out there of having people kind of figure out things a little bit on their own just by simple observation. But yeah, I mean, sometimes you can almost get in your own lane a little bit too much. And then somebody who's been doing something a lot longer can can kind of nudge you in right. the right direction. Totally. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's excellent. And, and speaking of going, you know, coming back to Southeastern Michigan, are, tell me a little bit about like your, your growing up. I mean, we talked about like you, your dad's relationship with yourself and like your, your thoughts on not really knowing what to do uh, when you graduated from high school. But so are you from, are you, did you grow up in Detroit or the tr Detroit area? Is that where you're from originally? So we um, moved here in, and when I was in first grade. Okay. So, um, so most of my life, yes, was uh, I grew up here. Um, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, it's so I, I would still consider Chicago my hometown. That's where I was born, and okay. we still kept in touch with our basically our church family. I went to church camp every year, okay, and stayed in touch with all of our Chicago friends. And now that are dispersed off throughout the U.S., but um, I still would consider Chicago my hometown. But um, so, but Detroit's my adopted home, obviously, and I'll be here, I'm sure, for a long time. Um, but it's a great, it's a, it's a really great city, and I'm really happy to see the renaissance of Detroit again. Um, you know, there's so much, there was so much talk about Detroit in all the bad ways mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. when the bankruptcy happened. I remember being at an airport. And I was in California. I think we were in Palm Desert or something. So Palm Springs Airport. And mm -hmm. we're, we're like um, getting on the plane for Detroit. And I probably was in Utah. I think it must have been in Utah. Anyway, um, and it was during the bankruptcy. And people looked at us like, oh, 
Is, is everything okay? Did you find like people live there? Like we yeah, all live there. We all make our living there. Like, <laughs> right. oh my gosh, like stop, stop watching the ruin of Detroit and everything. It was really interesting. Sure. The, the perspective that other people had um, <laughs> when that was all happening, because you know we live here, and you know it is what it is. It, right. It happened, but. You know, we Detroit's come out much stronger, obviously. Sure. Um, so I guess the best kept secret is is uh, like <laughs> it's it's a great place. You know, um, there's thankfully been way more um, conversations and media around the the rebirth of Detroit sure. and um, all of the really investment Dan Gilbert has put into the city. You know, I feel like the Illiches who owned the the Tigers and and the Red Wings were kind of the first um, first wave of investment in the city. And now Dan Gilbert um, is brought just a next level of re renovation, revitalization, building um, in the city. And that's been that's been pretty remarkable. So okay. uh, I do have to ask personally, you sound it yeah. sounds like you played soccer. So you said you wanted to be. Um, you know, you, you like the idea of being a, a world-class soccer player, sprinter. Did you grow up uh, playing soccer and running? I did. Yes. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. And I was, I, yeah, I, I think I played soccer until two years ago when I tore my plantar fascia. So I played oh, my whole gosh. life. Since like <laughs> yeah. Eight years old. And I'm like, I probably could go back and playing, but that was so painful. And it's, it took, I think, I mean, I'll always have a foot problem because of it, but, right. um, I'm so afraid of of tearing that again sure. that I I just I don't think I can do it. It's it yeah. It's like if there's nothing you can do except ice your foot for four times a day for six months. Like <laughs> great, who has time for that? Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> yeah, and well, the, unfortunately, it becomes a mental thing too. You know, I always yeah. wonder about athletes who come back from some really big injury and they're technically cleared to play, but then it's right. just lingering in their head. I, right, exactly. I, I had plantar fasciitis. It wasn't a tear, but I guess I had plantar fasciitis last year. And yeah, for a while, it's like, is this ever going to go away? But right. I had really good, you know, a, a physical therapist gave some, uh, you know, advice and a lot of stretching and ice. And then yeah. it just eventually, I'm like, wait a second, it doesn't hurt anymore. Oh, this is good. Uh, oh, so nice. Yeah, <laughs> I still have plantar fasciitis. So oh, that's no. bad. Yeah. Well, and the, the thing they, they gave, that's good. I mean, yeah, hopefully, and hopefully it'll go away altogether eventually. Yeah. I, they gave me inserts too. And those, you know, I'm like, Oh, I feel like so old, but you know what? They really helped. They helped a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Did you want yeah. to <laughs> That wraps up another edition of Modern Steel Construction's Field Notes podcast. Again, our guest this time around has been Trisha Ruby, president and CEO of Ruby and Associates. And I'm your host, Jeff Weisenberger. Thanks for listening, everyone.